Hey everybody and welcome back or welcome if you are new. Hello, hi. So I already filmed this intro but I need to film it again because of certain things, okay? In this vlog, we do several things. I recently moved to Sydney, Australia about a month ago, and when I got here, the first thing I did, of course, was get myself a library card, and I borrowed books for this video. Now, this video is gonna be a vlog where I am gonna do something that I have done before, which is read books recommended by my favorite booktubers, okay? So I did one for Gabby over at Gabby Reads, that's this one, and I did one for Kat over at Paperback Dreams, and that's this one, okay? In that video for Kat, I read Pen Pal, which a lot of people have been reading recently and loving. So just so you know, people, I have a vlog on Pen Pal. So this vlog isn't gonna have a focus. Rather than dedicate the entire video to one specific person, I am gonna be dedicating this video to four people. I read four books. Each book was for a favorite booktuber of mine. And in this vlog, I document my thoughts. I read books for the following people. For Haley over at Haley Hughes, I read In a Dark Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. For Gabby over at Gabby Reads, I read Daphne by Josh Mallerman. For Elizabeth over at Reading Riley, I read The Good Daughter by Karen Slaughter. And for a mystery person who I'm not gonna name, I don't wanna offend anyone, so I'm not gonna say... Let's just... I read The Paul Bears Club by Paul Tremblay, and I had high hopes in this book because despite not liking a lot of what I've read from this author. I did recently read Cabin at the End of the World because the new movie is coming out and I loved that book, okay? So I was like, I am capable of loving Paul Tremblay's work. So I'm gonna give him another chance and I read The Paul Bearers Club because it came highly recommended by a booktuber I really like and in the interest of not starting any shit, um, I will not mention who that booktuber is. I don't want to start anything. I'm gonna keep this footage in of the book because I worked hard to read most of it and I don't want to feel like I wasted my time. But just in the interest of not stepping into some shit and, you know, making someone think that I hate their taste in books, I'm just not gonna mention who liked this book, okay? It's gonna be a total mystery in the air. Don't guess in the comments, I will not answer, no comment. So with that being said, enjoy the vlog. Later that day. All right, so I don't know where to start. So I got the audiobooks for the most intimidating ones, namely this giant Karen Slaughter and the Paul Bears Club. Now, this is the one I'm dreading the most, so I think I'm gonna start with this one. Definitely not gonna start this one. We don't wanna start this fucking vlog with a slump. I'm so jet lagged. I go to sleep at like 9 p.m. and wake up at 12, 12 a.m. Okay, my body thinks I'm napping and it does not let me go fucking back to sleep. So I am heavily relying on this lighting over here to not make me look like the zombie I am. In the meantime, while I am suffering, because of jet lag and sleep deprivation and all that other fun stuff, I will be reading books. I just posted an Instagram story about these four books and I'm chatting with Gabby right now and she is giving me advice. She is giving me friendly advice. She said she gave this book one fucking star. So I have two opinions on this book. I've got five star and I've got Gabby's one star. I think I'm gonna just start with this book because I'm super curious to see where this is gonna go. First, I need to eat though. All right, this is today's lunch. We have some yellow rice and we have some lamb. So I'm one page in, the scene where he is describing the etymology of his name, and I'm fucking hating it. This is bullshit. This is the same bullshit that I hated in um, A Head Full of Ghosts. Him commenting on his own horror opinions and shit like that, and I'm like... This is gonna be a long fucking book. <laughs> Later that day. I got to page 54. I'm like so jet lagged and I literally don't give a fuck that people are across the street seeing me talk to myself like a fucking asshole. I mean, which I am in fairness, but whatever. I didn't know what camp I was gonna fall in and it is still too early to give you my full thoughts on this book. I'm not hating it so far, okay? I mean, I feel like it really helps to have the physical book in my hand because if I was just listening to the audiobook, I feel like I'd be super confused and super lost. I feel like you would have to have the book in your hand for this to make sense. But just the way this book is structured, so in the audiobook you have two voices. You have like a man's voice and a woman's voice. Over here in the book, the reason why that's the thing 
is because you're following the actual book that the person wrote and then every so often there is I don't know if you can see it. Hold on. Uh, yeah, there we go. There's commentary over here. Having the visual aids does help me grasp the story better, but it does give me the desired effect that Paul Tremblay hoped I would have. I think, I feel like, so what I can discern, we follow this guy named Art Barbara, who at the beginning of the book says he's writing a memoir-ish. So this memoir was written in present day, but it's about something he did when he was younger before going to college. Art Barbara is a fake name. The person who wrote this book insists, despite the fact that all the contents are true, the names are are fake, okay? So we follow this guy named Art who when he was 17 years old set up this thing called the Paul Bearers Club and he did so as an extra curricular activity to have a little extra special something in his college application because it is his goal to escape this town he grew up in and go to some school that isn't in that town. So basically the Paul Bearers Club is this club where he and a couple of other students go to these funerals of people that don't have guests and they sit in as the guests in these funerals for some reason. It was explained at some point but it sounded like fucking bullshit to me. And when I was reading the red commentary over here, it sounded like bullshit to them too. Because this guy, Art, is someone who is so woe is me, my life is so hard. But then the person commenting on the book says you are a privileged white cis man who did not grow up in poverty. You literally are doing the bare minimum to put something cool sounding on your college application to get you admitted to a college that wouldn't be that hard to get into considering your situation in life. So that's the kind of tone this book is giving me so far. And honestly, the commentary in this book is really funny and the storyline is kind of goofy. I'm only 50 pages in, but it's pretty fun so far. This could go into awful bullshit one star territory real quick, just like Head Full of Ghosts went into. But so far I'm not like mad, right? He makes these side comments that make him sound like an unreliable narrator. He claims that it's a memoir, but then he puts the exact line of dialogue and then immediately follows it with, I didn't say that, but I thought that. It's what I would have said in the moment. And then we read the commentary from the girl saying, you're saying this is a memoir but there's no way in freaking hell that you would have remembered all these lines of dialogue to the point that you could write it like a narrative saying it was an accurate memoir. There's no way you could have memorized all this dialogue. So why are you saying it's a memoir? The fuck? His tone is really petty and the girl doing the commentary, her tone is so sarcastic and rude and bitchy but also kind of offended with how she was portrayed in the story. At first I was like, who is this person doing the commentary? So we find out that the person doing the commentary is this woman named Mercy, who was apparently part of the Paul Bearers Club with Art. So she was the only other member because all the other members quit. And throughout the story, she is critiquing the way he recalls these events with a very dry, sarcastic, bitchy kind of tone. And it's really goofy. I don't know what genre this book is. So far, all Pell Tremblay has written has been thrillers and very meta horror. So I don't know what this is so far, but I am gonna try to get more reading in. No strong opinions beyond the fact that I'm not super mad, but that's all I'm gonna say for now. Check in soon. The next day.
So I did not update this vlog yesterday because it was a really busy day. Basically, we were going around the mall trying to get various government documents needed before applying for jobs over here. So it was a very exhausting day running around the mall like a headless fucking chicken. I did get some reading done yesterday and today, which I'm gonna tell you about now. It's been three days and I haven't finished a book for this vlog yet. And the common denominator, the common problem is this. I thought that it was gonna be a very wise, strategic move to read the book that I was dreading the most first. That would be this one. But it was a very dumbass move on my part because this book has been the thorn in my side for three fucking days because I literally just can't fucking bring myself to enjoy this. I'm trying. I mean, I went in kind of knowing what I was getting myself into because I had already read three Paul Tremblay books before and I have a mostly negative view of his work. I'm not entirely biased against him. If you watch my recent birthday vlog where I read Cabin at the End of the World, you will see that I praised that book. I did go into this book with an open mind. I did go into this book having recently really enjoyed and praised one of Paul Tremblay's works. And I did go into this book knowing that one of my favorite booktubers gave it five stars. So I was desperately hoping to like it. Oh my gosh. I am 154 pages in to the Paul Bearers Club, and I'm DNFing. Life is short, and I've already gone so long in this vlog without finishing a book that I am just scrapping this all together. Not the vlog, um, hopefully not the vlog, hopefully I get to finish the vlog, but let me just explain to you why I have chosen to DNF this book, despite the fact that I think in the early year update I said that I wasn't hating it. Every single thing I have hated about Paul Tremblay's writing, specifically in the book A Head Full of Ghosts, is in this book full force. That self-commentary approach that Head Full of Ghosts had is here, but without the element of horror and mystery to keep me invested. Head Full of Ghosts was so annoying and just a chore to read, but that whole subplot about the exorcist, whatever, and demonic possession was interesting enough to have me curious. Over here, there's literally nothing keeping me intrigued, and for the first, like, 40-50 pages, I was decently hooked. I mean, I was curious to see where the story was going and what was generally happening, but it was just so pompous and so cringe. Books written like this just come off as very the emperor has no clothes to me. It's like they are written with such highfalutin words and such like pseudo-academic descriptions, long and rambling and just pretentious. Just because the story comments on itself like from the mercy point of view over here, that makes it okay, but like even though the commentary does push back against certain annoying things in this book, it doesn't mean that I don't have to read through the annoying things to understand what makes the commentary good. Stuff like this is just not what I'm looking for, and I realize that I probably dug myself a hole thinking that I could potentially like this, but Ugh, just not it. What really lost me was a hundred pages in when paranormal shit started happening. That just lost me. I was like, this is ridiculous. And the book does acknowledge that it was ridiculous. Yeah, you can't write something that's super eye-rollingly dumb and just comment on it, say, oh, I wrote something eye-rollingly dumb and I recognize that. Excuse me. I was about ready for this book to be over at that point. There is a thrilling aspect to see like when she's gonna call him out because like he does go into some pretty suspicious things and she does not comment on that part and it's like, oh, so did this vaguely paranormal vampire thing actually happen? So it's kind of thrilling to see when she's gonna call him out on his bluff. But other than that, there's really nothing much that kept me entertained. There's long rambling tangents about surgeries that he had because of his back and how he suffers from sleep apnea and then there's like a full like two full pages explaining what sleep apnea is and how he copes with it and it's like bitch that's not fucking storytelling and at the end of the day even though there could be a main idea or strong thing tying everything together at the end, I really don't give a fuck. Because the only thing holding this story together is this spine. Everything in here just does not 
do it for me, okay? Here's the thing. Another reason I chose to DNF this was because when we went to the mall yesterday, obviously I didn't want to bring this hardcover book with me. So I was like, why don't I just start in a dark, dark wood? So that's what I did. I listened to the audiobook of this while I was at the mall, and I got 14 chapters in from the audiobook alone because I was so fucking invested, okay? So I was like, maybe I'm just not in the mood to be reading, and actually I am in the mood to be reading because I got a third through this book walking around a mall because I was that hooked and that invested. So we're gonna put this book down. That's where that's going. And I'm gonna tell you about In a Dark Dark Wood. So basically this book opens up with this woman named Nora and she gets this invitation to a wedding, to a hen party, I think. So it's basically this bachelorette weekend party where they party with this woman named Claire who is about to get married. And she's like, I've known Claire since my childhood, but something went down in the past. So it's like, why does Claire want me here? That's weird. So Nora and a couple of other friends go to this remote cottage to attend Claire's hen party. It's like actually so juicy. We see certain things get revealed about these women. It's so trashy, it's so dramatic, and honestly the reviews on this book are hilarious. Mild spoilers, we find out that someone is hooking up with someone's ex, and there's like inner jealousies and someone is trying to stir the pot and cause these women to fight, okay? It is so funny and so trashy and I'm actually kind of really invested. I was describing the plot of this book to my sister in the car on the way home and she was like, is that a comedy? And I was like, no, it's apparently, according to the Sunday Mirror, a genuinely chilling and totally compulsive novel, okay? And then, according to The Independent, the year's hottest crime novel. Someone died in this hen party. We don't know who it is. We just cut back to chapters where we're told that something happened to someone. Bitch, someone died. I don't know who it's gonna be, I don't know who it is, but so far I am 14 chapters in. So I'm gonna try to finish this book today, and then afterward maybe dive into Karen Slaughter. Check in soon. Later that day. Anyone can literally walk by and see what I'm doing and normally this would give me social anxiety but I'm just so dead inside that I don't give a fuck at this point. So hello friendly neighbors. Also I don't fucking know anyone here. So I am flying through this book. I'm currently on page 228. I read like a hundred pages in one sitting just now and I'm really enjoying this. It's super entertaining and I don't know if that's because the book itself is phenomenal or if I'm just comparing it to this piece of literary shit backed up the asshole. Either this is amazing or it just looks amazing in comparison to this torture that I was putting myself through. I'm really invested in the story. Haley was right, this is fun trash, and I am digging it, okay? So, so far we find out who was killed. It's still a bit like up in the air regarding the specific circumstances surrounding this person's death and who was really behind it and what the underlying motivations were, but it's really like tea spilling and shallow and just really funny at this point. I don't really have much to update beyond that, so check in soon when I am done. Hey everybody, hi. So it's been a while since I updated this vlog and hello, how do I look? Do not answer that in the comments. So let me just say this, I finished one book and read one whole entire book without opening this vlog to give an update, but I'm gonna open it now and rectify the situation. It's been really hard to vlog while doing life stuff. I'm in a different country, I'm job hunting, and I can confirm to you all pretty much that no matter where you are in the world, job hunting is a tiring, frustrating, and difficult process, okay? So doing that on top of, you know, navigating life in a new country, all the way on top of reading books, vlogging, editing, and 
other shit. It's just been a lot, to say the least. But I finished In a Dark Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. I gave it three and a half stars. I really enjoyed it. I didn't go in with super high expectations because although Haley really loved it, she did tell me on her live show that a lot of people give this book a very low score because it's like really shallow. And having read and been able to appreciate The Lion Game, I did go into this one kind of prepared, very much understanding what I was getting myself into, and I really enjoyed it. Yes, it was shallow, but it was a really fast, quick read. Um, it kept me guessing, it kept me on my toes. The reveals were sufficiently juicy. Her writing is just so British. It's good, I mean, I enjoyed it. And I can definitely say that I am happy to read more from Ruth Ware. I get the same enjoyment out of these thrillers that I get from books by Robin Harding and occasionally Taryn Fisher, okay? You go in knowing it's gonna be shallow and trashy, but also like a really fast, fun time that's gonna keep you guessing. So yeah, three and a half or four stars along that line. That is what I give in a dark, dark wood. So today we're gonna talk about the other book I finished and that is The Good Daughter by Karen Slaughter. I read this for Elizabeth over at Reading Riley and I was super excited to read this, but oh my gosh. um. Let me just start by saying I liked this book, okay? I thought this was a good book. I gave this book four stars. This is objectively a fantastic book. It has so many incredible things just off the top of my head. The fascinating characters, the dark story, the way the backstory is just so dark and just how much of a role it plays in the story and the fact that there are so many complex motivations around. Every single character is just so deep, is so flawed, has such a fraught relationship with one another. We follow this family with a very dark past. They are a family of lawyers, they get involved in this legal case and the people involved in that case are also very disturbed, dealing with things that are very dark, and the lines between antagonist and protagonist are very blurred. Although there are, you know, without a doubt, some very bad people who are objectively awful and evil and irredeemable, as there are with all Karen Slaughter books, the reasoning behind certain motivations and other people who you think are mostly antagonists is really fascinatingly morally gray. So there is so much to love about this book. Another thing that it does so well as with all Karen Slaughter books, is that first chapter. Every single Karen Slaughter book I have read has a first chapter that just knocks it out of the park. It has like a little twist at the end of the first chapter that makes you like shook, makes you shit yourself. Here is where this book loses me, okay? It's very, very long. It is a very long book. Finishing this book was like climbing a mountain, okay? It was very beautiful on the way up in terms of scenery and everything around it being just really beautiful, just like how this book was very well done. But it just took so much out of me to finish this book because it's so long. I find that Karen Slaughter seems to be recycling the same beats over and over again. I don't know if this is the case with most of her books, but with the ones that I have read, specifically Pretty Girls and False Witness, they all seem to follow very, very, very similar story beats that I started to see and that started to make this get quite boring. So with Pretty Girls and False Witness, we have the amazing first chapter, we have two sisters with a fraught relationship, we have them getting embroiled in a certain thing that is very dark, that forces them to reconnect. There's a huge midway plot twist. And because of all that, I just didn't find this to be as compelling as the other Karen Slaughter books that I had read. It is a very good book and I do recommend it. I really don't have anything negative to say beyond the fact that I have read Karen Slaughter before and this book is very long. For those of you who don't know what this book is about, we follow these two people whose name I forgot. So we follow Charlotte and Samantha. The story opens up with them as very young kids. They with their mother. They have this dad who is named Rusty, I think. He is a lawyer who is known for representing some of the most evil people in society, like murderers, fists, etc., whatnot. And as a result, he has gotten many enemies. The book opens up with a very dark first chapter. Something awful happens to this family. And then after that first chapter, there's a time jump and we follow one of the daughters, I'm not gonna say who, and we learn that she is a lawyer and she finds herself in the middle of this 
very dark turn of events that forces her to reconnect with certain members of her family and put her law degree into practice. She's forced to undergo this kind of investigation to help somebody out who's going through something super dark and twisted. So you get the family dynamics, you get the thriller, you get the criminal law side, which frankly was more compelling in False Witness than it was over here. So that's what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, what the story was about. And yeah, so False Witness, I gave this four stars. I think I'm gonna go to the beach. And yeah, check in soon. So today we're gonna be talking about the final book of this vlog and that would be Gabby's book Gabby over at Gabby Reads one of my closest friends on here Daphne by Josh Mallerman I read like the first 60 pages when I was at the park and I wasn't super into it at first okay let me just start off by saying that I wasn't obsessed it wasn't speaking to me as a person it was kind of like taking its time and I just couldn't get into the writing but I'm happy to announce that after that first rough 60 pages, I read this whole entire last stretch in one fucking sitting because it really picked up it hit the ground running, and I was just into it. So what's this book about? Okay, so we follow this young girl named Kit Lamb. It's the last summer before college. She's a basketball player in her high school, and the night before the big game, one of the team members tells them this story about this urban legend about a bitch named Daphne, okay? She's like, there was a bitch named Daphne who went to our school back in the 70s, I believe, and she died under some mysterious circumstances, okay? She was murdered. Some say that she was unalived. Some say that she unalived herself. It's really weird. Like, it's a very different thing for each and every person in this story. And some allege that Daphne herself is a unaliver. Okay, now Kit realizes that she can't stop thinking about Daphne. She can't get this specific story about this person out of her head. So, shit starts to happen, okay? And before she knows it, certain teammates start getting unalived. Is this Daphne person real? Is this all just coincidence? The people getting killed are getting killed closer to Kit's inner circle and she thinks that she's next and she's freaking out. Now, what did I think of this book? I thought this book was very good. I really enjoyed this book. I'm so glad I read this book. It was really good. I would argue that there definitely is room for coming of age stories in the horror genre because getting older and leaving the nest is a concept that I think is terrifying, okay? It is so fucking terrifying. There's no more what's my homework gonna be. There's no more what's my grade on this test gonna be. It's straight up, what the fuck am I gonna do with my fucking life? And that is some of the scariest shit that I can imagine thinking of. It's the phase that I am currently in, in my life. I am not doing the best. I could be doing better. Um, we're not getting into that. But let me just say this, I do feel this anxiety so much and just seeing it played out and feeling like I wasn't the only one was beautiful to feel in my soul, okay? Like what the fuck is going on in the world? Existing in this world is really hard, you know? It, it sucks. Anyway, as I was saying, so something I really liked about this book was just how similar it was to Japanese movies like The Ring, The Grudge, this whole urban legend slash curse story. But what I loved a lot about this book in specific was how the curse was deeply linked with mental health, specifically the mental health condition of its protagonist, Kit. She has severe anxiety, as do I, okay? I am an anxiety person from 9 to 5, and from 5 to 12, 
and all the hours of the day I am just like a fucking nervous wreck. I have very bad anxiety. <laughs> Speaking into a camera is sometimes physically painful to me, but it's a lot easier than making eye contact with people, which is something I can't fucking do. How do you guys do that, okay? Let me, can I ask you something? Because I had like a fucking job interview just the other day, and normally it's on Zoom, but at this one, they wanted me to go into the company, and I was like, you know, I got this. I've done face-to-face -face interviews before, but I don't know what it was. I think it might have been during the pandemic. I think it might have exacerbated my anxiety, and making eye contact is hard. It is so difficult. I, I, what, how do you guys do it? I did it anyway, but it was tough. Another tangent, another side note nobody asked for, but here we go. I'm just gonna assume that you enjoy these chill chats with me, okay? So what is it with this Daphne chick? The deal with Daphne is that if you think about her enough, she will kill you. She will track you down and she will fucking fuck you up. And I'm not gonna edit any of these cuss words out because the algorithm already fucking hates me. So what, I mean, what am I gonna do? Try to be consumer friendly? Fuck that. Shit. Fuck that. That ain't me. Now, this is a huge issue because it's literally impossible not to think about something when you're told not to think about something, you know? Like when people say, hey, there's only 360 days in a year and in four years you're gonna be in your 30s, so you only have like a thousand plus days to enjoy your 20s, and that feeling is painful, okay? It's it's horrible. Just knowing how little time you have to exist is just, is fucked up, and I can't stop thinking about it, and I hate that for me. I related so much to Kit because so much of my anxieties are rooted in my deep fear of the future. Like, life is hard. I'm not, I'm not excited, okay? <laughs> I, I'm just like not looking forward to any of that shit. So fear of the future and wondering if I am the biggest person stopping me from achieving my dreams because of how scared I am, because of just how anxious I am to take certain risks. That's a huge thing that Kit faced. That's a huge thing that I faced. And that's a huge metaphor in the story because a lot of um, this has to do with them playing basketball, so are you gonna take the risk and shoot the ball, potentially, you know, fuck everything up for your team, or potentially succeed? Like, taking that risk shot, taking the shot, taking the risk, is a huge thing that she is very scared to do because of her anxiety. Taking the shot is very similar with taking an opportunity, and sometimes anxiety gets in the way of wanting to take a certain opportunity because of rejection, etc. And you can't just get used to anxiety. Let me know if you can relate or don't, if it's too personal. But I have opened up to people and they've told me things like, it's all in your head. And it's like, you think the fuck a lot. Yeah, you think I don't fucking know that? Certain people who don't deal with anxiety or certain people who don't have anxiety as I do um, They think you can just will these thoughts away Which is just not something that you can do and it's just really scary how Despite the fact that mental health is far more discussed today than it ever has been There are still so many people from older generations who just aren't willing to understand you who just think you need to harden your hide and that you can get through anything if you just will yourself to do so and just are unwilling to understand or put themselves in your shoes. It just sucks, okay? And it's something that I go through in my personal life and again, just seeing it in a book like this made me feel less alone, you know? And I just love that for me. And I really liked how this book linked anxiety with the fear of impending doom of a killer ghost because it can get you at any time. Like, it literally comes out at any time, it fucks you up, it's horrible to fucking deal with. Because that's what anxiety is. It's like this invisible monster that can just come up and kill you when it feels like, or just hit you when you're down, kick you in the teeth. And I also really love how Kit in this book mentions that her anxiety gets so much worse at night, because that's definitely something that I can relate to on a very deep and cellular level. Like, when the sun is up, when the weather is bright, it is a lot easier to manage these feelings. But when the sun goes down and nighttime comes, that's when the, like, monsters come out to just, like, pounce and attack you when you're feeling the most vulnerable. I love how 
Kit mentions this thing passingly in this book about how petty advice doesn't work, but drugs do, which is honestly such an interesting thing to reflect on because we've all been given that advice that obviously was given by someone who didn't care to understand our situation and the temptation to indulge in substances. I'm not saying I relate to this, maybe, I don't know, we'll see, is a reason as to why people can get addicted to certain things like alcohol or drugs because they just need anything to escape the profoundly awful and difficult emotional turmoil that anxiety puts them in. I also just loved the youthful sense of camaraderie in this story. Like the bond between all of these friends just felt so real and so palpable and it's something that I truly enjoyed reading about. It reminded me so much of the film It Follows because of the whole coming of age horror thing and the recent film Smile because of the whole curse, urban legend, linkage of the horror to the mental health aspect. It also reminded me of coming of age stories like Myth of the American Sleepover. Now the first 60 pages, as I said, was really rough, but what got in the way of me truly loving this book because it is a book that I really like, but it's a book that I feel like I admire more than love, okay? Now, I did give this four stars, I did really love this book, but the reason I personally removed a star is because of the writing style. I felt like this writing style didn't suit the story it was trying to tell. I felt like the writing hindered me being able to fully appreciate the story. This kind of writing is like third person, barely any dialogue, very um, stream of consciousness. There's a lot of the book that tells us about certain characters, but I feel like it tells us more than it shows us. I prefer being shown something as opposed to just told something, as opposed to just told something. The writing style hindered me from enjoying this book so much at times. I felt like I was watching an incredible film with a wonderful story, but I was watching it through like a film of soup. Like there was something blurry that was inhibiting me from fully seeing the film at times. And that's kind of how I felt reading this book, trying my best to immerse myself in this story. Another thing that I thought got in the way of this story was the parts where we were there during the murders happening. It's not a spoiler to say that people do gradually start to get killed. It's right here on the back. I'm not gonna say what the reveal in the story is, but I feel like the fact that we were put in those scenes really got in the way of the ambiguity and tension of the book. Also, the kills were very... The way they were described was very underwhelming. The kills in this book are very brutal, they're very intense, they're very gnarly, but they're all described in one sentence and it's so passively written. Like there wasn't any descriptive gore, it didn't really feel as immersive as it could have otherwise. It takes away a significant amount of tension when you find out that a certain thing is happening and I feel like we could have found that out further into the story to hold us in tension just a bit longer. There was one notable scene that I really loved that really shook me, really scared the shit out of me, and it's when the mom is telling her about a certain story from her childhood when she was in this candy store, a story that's somehow related to Daphne, whether or not Daphne actually exists, I'm not gonna give it away. But that story about the candy store with the blue rabbit mascot fucking creeped me out. It creeped me out, okay, bitch. With all that being said, I really dug this book. I liked it. I gave it four stars. My only complaint is that I wish the writing had been more immersive because I feel like that would suit a coming of age story better. But I really liked how it highlighted the fear of not being in the right path in life and that mental health can't be suppressed or ignored. It has to be talked about or else it could kill you, frankly. So yeah, that's my thoughts on Daphne. Great stuff. Really enjoyed this. If you made it this far, leave an emoji of your favorite fruit, okay? Because, you know, fun stuff. I want to know more about you. I like mangoes, watermelons, and apples. Those are my top three. And with that being said, I hope to see you in future videos. And as always, take care. I lose myself